eternal values that are laid out by the Bible. There is also a feeling that there are a lot of young people who want to pursue very easy ways of making money. It's become a problem in our generation. I am shocked at the numbers of young people who feel that within a year or two of working, they must have access to the same level of resources that others may have taken about a decade to earn. When I was growing up, they used to say that when, if you are a couple and you have a problem, you have to go and tell your landlord. Because in those days, by the time somebody had money to put up a house, the person would have had great experience in life. So they tend to be people who were very wise. And building a house was a sign of the wise use of money, of resources. I'm not suggesting that if you're a young man and you have money, don't put up a house. I'm just telling you what used to happen when I was much younger. But we live in a season, a period, a generation, where people want to have access to things they haven't worked for. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was going for a lecture. The young man who was a, a student in the place where I was going to teach packed my vehicle. And as soon as I parked, he walked up to me and to my surprise, this is just about two or three weeks ago, he knelt down. Just before, I had he even closed the, the door. He knelt down. He said, Prof, lay your hands on me that I may also receive this favor. And I said, what favor? He said, the car. <laughs> I left my job in the bank in 1982. And I have been in the ministry for 33 years. When I entered Trinity as a student, I was 22 years old. So I have worked for more than 30 years. He hasn't completed school. He wants... <laughs> in 1 Timothy 6.10, Paul says, 1 Timothy 6.10, Paul says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And today... We want to use the pulpit to glorify money. Money is good. If I get money, I, I, I like it. Eat good food, have a nice house. So there's nothing wrong with it. But Paul says, if you pursue money with greed in mind, you will be led astray. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. I remember preaching at a, a wedding a couple of and I and one of the lines of the prayer that he put when he was praying prayed for the couple say may money chase you and when he finished praying and I had to give the blessing I told the couple and the money chases you have nowhere to go come to my house <laughs> In their eagerness to, to be rich, Paul says in the same text, 1 Timothy 6.10, Some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. In their eagerness to be rich, there's nothing wrong with wealth, but it has to be earned in the right way. It has to be earned in his time. This age, the age in which we live, is an age that I will call an age of conspicuous consumption. 
I don't know whether it makes sense. Conspicuous consumption means to want to have things as a public show. Everything you see, you want to buy. And there are young couples whose economic lives are in disarray because they are buying things they can't afford. Some even buying them on credit. This is the age. Because the media, in particular, presents to us luxurious items as necessities. I received a report from a young woman whose husband will not wear anything that is not a global brand. Friend, and he did not have the means. So he had to undermine the finances. In the end, he lost his job. Now you have no money. Go and buy branded items. If you are wearing a t-shirt and it's Gucci, who cares? You may have bought yours for $100, $120. Somebody can also go and buy his as a station for 10 cities. Who cares? Money is not a bad thing. But to live life as if it is all about money has led lives to crash and brought pain, considerable pain, to families. Thus, Paul consistently, Paul, very consistently, warned his younger mentees, the people he was mentoring, about what it meant to diligently pursue certain godly values that possess long-term effects. Some of the things that you run after may bring you satisfaction, but they may be short-term. Because of my work, I come into contact with a lot of young people who want to do well in life. And I say to them, the place to start is to take your studies seriously. Not too long ago, a young man came to see me. He had become suicidal. I say somebody has become suicidal, somebody who feels that he wants to take his life. He's just about 30 years old. I asked him about his life, what he was doing, he was a student, and so on. I said, I asked him, why have you become suicidal? Why do you want to take your life? And he says to me in my office, I think I have failed. You are not 30 years and you think you have failed? You are a university student. You haven't even completed. And you think you have failed. What about those who never had the opportunity to go to school? But at the end of the conversation, he had realized that the path he had chosen was a foolhardy one. Paul consistently told his mentees. Listen to what he told Titus. Titus chapter 2, verse 1, and then verse 6 to 8. He says, but as for you, and I'd like you to take note of how he starts. He says, but as for you. In other words, other people may be making other choices. But as for you, teach what is consistent with sound doctrine. From verse 6, show yourself in all respect a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, gravity and sound speech that cannot be censured. Then any opponent will be put to shame, have nothing evil to say of us. There are certain things in life that cannot be rushed. Whether you like it or not, one of them is Christian maturity. There is no shortcut to maturity in life. So study to show yourself approved. Be diligent in what you are doing. It doesn't matter how small. Commit yourself to it. So Titus was admonished to choose to be different. 
to pursue excellence in ministry by being a person of integrity. All the things I'm going to say to you at the end of this message is that you must decide whether you want to be one of three characters. A drifter, a failure, or a conqueror. Study to show yourself approved. And I want you to ask yourself, do I want to be a drifter? Paul says they loved money and so they had drifted. And when you drift from your set goals, you are heading towards failure. Do you want to be a drifter, a failure, or a conqueror? Against the backdrop of Paul's word to Timothy to study in order to show himself approved, this year I have been speaking a lot about pressing on with purpose. Pressing on with purpose. Because studying to show yourself approved has something to do with working hard at it and being consistent. So anyone who has heard me preach or speak anywhere this year would have heard me talk about the fact that my personal theme, which is also the theme for the church where I serve, is purposefulness. When we talk about purpose, we are talking about the reason for which something exists. The reason for which the thing was created. Or the reason for which something is done. So, see that most of you are young people. As I said, don't wake up in the morning and start your life. In fact, don't go to bed without knowing the first thing you would do in the morning when you wake up. Sometimes I even have to write it and put it on my desk, the place where I sit to read my Bible and to pray, so that I know the first thing I want to tackle. The word purpose goes with many others that relate to human behavior. And the words are many. Determination is one of them. Perseverance is one of them. Resolution, to resolve. To be ambitious. You have to be ambitious. I don't know everybody's background. But from where I started, you needed to be ambitious a certain way. Because you were competing with people who were more privileged than you were. These days, when you tell the younger generation, they, they even sometimes refuse to believe that what you are saying is the truth. I didn't have a opportunity to attend any school that you call international school, maybe like many of you. 4.30 a.m., I have to go and sell chewing stick before I go to school. Close at 12, come home to pound for food, eat before I go back. 4.30 to go and sell sugar cane. When I was in high school, Form 4, we did a, an essay competition. I wrote. I got in. It was supposed to take me to the U.S. The cost at that time was 16000 And my family was supposed to pay 4000 out of it. And my father didn't have it, so I didn't go. So the only way in which to make it in life was to make sure that in spite of everything that is thrown at you, at least you stay with your book. So I tell people, my father didn't have money, but he gave me two things. He gave me God, and he gave me school. And these two things will take you far. If you believe that, say amen. amen. You have to have initiative. You have to be enterprising. You have to be motivated if you want to be purposeful. You have to do things out of conviction. But most importantly, you have to be passionate. Ask yourself why the story of Jesus dying on the cross is called the passion. The passion of the Christ. Jesus knew what he wanted. Jesus knew the purpose for which he had come to this world. 
and he pursued his purpose with passion. He was so passionate about it that when his lead apostle Peter tried to discourage him from it, Peter became Satan to him. And of course, passion comes with commitment. If you want your marriage to succeed, it's not just about having resources. It's about being passionate about the relationship. If you, when students come to me, they say, bro, my long essay or my thesis, give me a topic. I say to them, that is not how to write a thesis. If you want to write a thesis, be sure that you are in love with the topic. Because if you are in love with a woman, you always want to see her. Anna Mebwa. So if you are in love with your topic, you will be motivated to work at it. It's like marriage. So the way to start is to be passionate about something constructive. And if you find people who are passionate about what they are doing, they refuse to be distracted. And in fact, that is what will lead you to cut off anyone who becomes a distraction. There are people who can be your colleagues, but it's not everyone that you must bring into your world, especially when you realize that they are a distraction for you. God. God is a purposeful God. If you don't know that God is a purposeful God, look at the way you are formed. The psalmist says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Look at where you're eyes are located and your ears are located and your hands are located and your legs and you can see that the person who created you very carefully very purposely designed you so God is a God of purpose in fact the call to purposefulness was also very much on the lips of Jesus that's why he told the disciples I am the vine you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. So purposefulness will lead to fruitfulness. When you study to show yourself approved unto God, you become productive. You become fruitful. At the end of every day, you can look back. One of the things that frustrates me is to come to the end of a day and not be able to say what I have done during that day. You come to the end of every day, every week. You must point to something that you have achieved in your life. So Jesus says in verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. So that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Sometimes we all become like James and John who went to Jesus and said, give us whatever we ask. And so we bring, you listen to the tone of prayer. Listen to the tone of prayer. It's all become decreeing and declaring and claiming. There's nothing wrong with that, but it has to go with purposefulness. People have to be taught to be purposeful. You did not choose me, but I chose you. That you might go and, uh, and bear fruit. Fruit that will abide. Some fruits are fake and temporal. Jesus says we are called to bear fruit that abides. In other words, it is not every fruit that is enduring. It is not everything that is worth fighting for. Some look glorious, but only Fisher. It's like going to being attracted to something because it looks outwardly nice. I went to buy furniture recently and there was a particular one that attracted me. So I was standing by it and negotiating. Then there was a young man. I didn't know him or let me say I didn't think I knew him. So he walked up to me and whispered in my ears. He said, I saw for men talk. 
And very subtly, he held my dress and tried to pull me aside. So I sort of drifted towards him. And then he said to me, Yaina yawaha. Nkungwan, yani yinana, if ya brochure by it. Nia wujina hono. And ye papa nibia. I mean to me, my own talk. Would ye, would ye, eh? Professor, I don't have eyes to see furniture. <laughs> but he said to me, don't buy that one. Rather, this one, you know. And then he said to me, if I say this to you where you were standing, my colleagues will say I'm spoiling their market. That is why I have pulled you aside. Then we agreed that I will go home. He will take pictures of the different furniture that are the quality ones. And then I will make my choice so that they don't see that they have, he has spoiled their business. So some things look outwardly nice. But inside, sometimes human beings can be like that. You are attracted to somebody because you think physically they look nice. A young man looks handsome by your standards anyway. I'm not somebody who is very much attracted to beauty pageants because I don't think people should be rewarded for something they have no control over. I don't mind if you reward people for their talent and ability. Because if you have a talent, you have to work on it. But if you were born that way, why should I reward you for being born the way you were born? So, I'm not, I'm not very fond of beauty pageants. I'm not very fond of them. Jesus told the disciples, if you bear fruit that abides, my father will give you everything you ask. God responds to diligent behavior. God responds to diligent behavior. Study to show yourself approved. God responds to diligent behavior. So, you have to press on. You have to press on. To press on is to persevere. And to persevere with purpose. We have all been in secondary school. In my time was one of my classmates who was in a relationship with a younger, uh, a, a junior. And they were living on the campus as if they were a married couple. Went on and on and on and on. Many years after, many, many years after, I went to preach in a church. I saw the young lady. She was an usher. She came to say hello to me, and I asked, so, how is so-so and so? She stood there with her head bowed. Oh, pastor, we didn't marry. What? And you could see you could see the regret. See the regret. Sharing with some university students just on this Legon campus. You come to campus, there's nothing wrong with attending Christian fellowship, doing evangelism. But your parents did not bring you to the university to be a pastor or to be a prayer warrior. Your first responsibility on that campus is to study and get a degree. If you are admitted to do biochemistry, nobody is going to give you a degree for being a prayer warrior. So pray. But your first priority should be your studies. So persevere. If you want to know an example, look at Jesus. Hebrews 12. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. 
looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding his shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of God. Hallelujah. If Jesus persevered, what, what, what makes you think that you can realize it by decreeing and declaring and spending your time anyhow? Purposefulness means you have a reason for doing what you are doing and usually there is an expected end in view. What do you want to achieve? Where do you want to get to? That is why scripture says, study to show yourself approved. Work towards it. But the Bible recognizes that in perseverance, we can be distracted, as I have said. There are many things that can be a distraction to you. The circumstances of life can weigh against you. The circumstances of life. It is nobody's fault. Maybe where you were born. I remember I was going to look for a friend outside of a crowd. I entered the town and he had asked a nephew to come and meet me. This was in Winneba. The nephew came to meet me and he sat in the car. We were driving towards the house. I like to talk to young people and find out what they are doing and so on. I asked him, what do you do? He said, I'm a student. Where? He said, Obrachere Secondary School. I didn't say anything. <laughs> but <laughs> even those who <laughs> attended Accra, Accra and Brempe and so on, sometimes they struggle. Oh, Bradshaw! <laughs> but that's where the circumstances of life have placed him. This friend I'm talking about that I was going to look for is going to be with the Lord now. It was my colleague. We were both teaching at Trinity. And one day, I think he had had a funeral. Yes. His mother had died. So we had to travel to Winneba for the funeral. And I went, I parked, a young man came to collect my gowns and so on. And then he said to me, I'm the one who attended Obrachere Secretary School. He <laughs> said, What are you doing now? Say I'm studying, a, I'm studying to be a public health nurse or something like that. And I was impressed. Because the first time he mentioned the school, you know, I, he saw it from my face. <laughs> I'm not saying it's, not, it's a bad school, but I hadn't heard of it. You know, sure, it's a good school. There are people there who are doing well and so on. So that's not the point. But the point is that the circumstances of life can position you such that you may start from a disadvantaged situation. Sometimes generational choices. There are people who are carrying diseases not because they asked for it. It's just because their grandfather had it and their father had it. It's no fault of theirs. So, if you sit down and blame the disease, they're not going to do anything. Generational choices. Maybe your father or your mother made a mistake of some sort and it's affecting you. Sometimes family matters can affect you. Circumstance of family, you can be in a difficult family situation. Sometimes relationships. Other times your own personal weaknesses. The things that fight against us are many. The student who passed through our hands. Somebody comes to seminary, you see somebody with potential. I have been on committees where we want to give somebody an opportunity. Maybe there's an opening for a church in New York and you say, let's take this young man. And some people in the committee will say, he's not bad, but his wife is a problem. 
And people have lost opportunities simply because there are people in their lives who are problematic. So all these things can weigh against you. All these things can weigh against you. But as I said, also personal weaknesses. People start well. They either become too money conscious, you put them in charge of a big congregation, they become too arrogant. And as the Bible would say, pride goes before a fall, and then they are brought down and so on. These besetting sins of the flesh, failures, weaknesses in life, must never be allowed to have the last word. They must never be allowed to have the last word. Because God is a God of opportunity. God will not design life such that it goes against anyone. There is not a single person in the scriptures that God called and who was not giving a clear purpose for his or her calling. And you have to tell yourself from today, I have a purpose for being here. You have a purpose and I have a purpose for being here. The list is endless. Noah was called to build the ark. Abraham was called to be the father of the covenant. Moses was called to be a, a deliverer. And so was Deborah, the judge. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. And in the New Testament, Mary, the disciples, and Paul. Each of them had a purpose. Many of these people achieved their purposes. But others, like David, Samson, Uzziah, and Judas, drifted. Some of them became failures in some parts of their lives. So today we talk about David as a great king, but we also talk about him as a murderer because he allowed his personal weaknesses to overcome him. These people drifted by compromising their purposes and became casualties of certain vain and carnal choices that they made in life. One of the saddest stories of the Old Testament is the story of Uzziah. After great success as a king, the man was made a king at age 16. Great success. Read his story in 2 Chronicles 26. His success got into his head. Uzziah became proud and he died a leper because he stubbornly resisted good counsel from the priest. Samson perished alongside the very enemies he was called to deal with because he could not exercise self-control over his sexuality. The man, Samson, started his ministry as a charismatic figure in the hands of God, but he ended up entertaining drunken Philistines, put him in prison, and when they are drunk and they want an entertainer, they bring this person who started life with such a glorious ministry. The other one, Judas, sold his conscience for 30 pieces of silver. And today, he has earned an unenviable place in the history of the Bible. My dear friends, the things I'm telling you are not just biblical stories. I do not want anyone listening to me this morning to be a casualty of wrong choices. There are real life examples of many people who started well but who drifted from their goals and failed. God does not want you to be a drifter. God does not want you to be a failure. God wants you to be a conqueror. All these things, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Hallelujah. Amen. And the one who loved us is Jesus, the Christ. 
There are examples of success stories in terms of purposefulness. One of them, for example, is Paul. Listen to him. Philippians 3, 7 to 12. Philippians 3, 7 to 12. Yet, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. I, I regard everything as loss. I put aside certain things. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal but I press on amen? amen I press on to make it my own because Christ has made me his own the critical expression here is but I press on meaning in spite of the obstacles I press on that is why I said you got to be diligent. When you are diligent, you are not distracted. Because you know who you are. You know you are a disciple. And disciples must mature in Christ. And as I have said, maturity has no shortcuts. I press on for a reason. I press on to make it my own. Because Christ has made me his own. That's what Jesus said. You did not choose me, but I chose you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will abide. Your purpose is to bear abiding fruit and the means to realize that purpose is to press on towards the goal for which Christ has made you his own. Yesterday, I spent the evening, part of the evening, listening to a message that somebody sent me even my wife noted that it was very unusual because she saw me with the phone and playing the thing or it was on speaker. I went to the bedroom, I had it, I climbed upstairs to my study, I had it in the night, you know. So this morning, she asked me when I was getting ready to come, what were you listening to yesterday? It was very unusual for me to listen to that sort of thing for our 40 minutes. Somebody had shared an issue with me. It's a, a, a marriage issue. And when she was sharing it with me, she, has, she used an expression. The expression was, he treated me very badly. So I sent a message back to ask, unpack, those was my, my, these were my words, unpack for me what you mean by he treated me badly. And I think she couldn't write. So the result was the 40 minute recording. <laughs> but why am I telling you this? Why am I telling you this? She had brought her daughter to say hello to me. And the daughter had gotten a, a scholarship to go and continue her studies abroad. And we needed to, as it were, talk to her and so on. But to live abroad, stay away from certain temptations and so on so you can achieve your purpose and all that. But in this long story, in this long story, there was a silver lining. When the gentleman was abandoning his family, the youngest was less than two years old. And it's been almost... 25 years. And I was encouraged because you had four children 
you were abandoned. In the course of the narration, she says, I decided that I have to invest everything I have in these children. And I can tell you, looking at where they are, the single mother needs to be congratulated. Those are some of the decisions you have to make in life. When certain people or certain things fail you, you don't give up. You press on. In the quest towards purposefulness, the Bible reminds us that the road can be rough and tough. And that is why Paul says, I press on. And Jesus despised the shame of the cross. Because life is an examination that is not terminal. And we went to school. At the end of the term, or at the end of the year, you took an examination that was terminal. Life's examinations are not terminal. They are there. It doesn't matter your age. You are always being examined. So you have to live your life as if you are always responding to an examination question. So, it's the same experience that faced those who conquered in the Bible. And that is why we are encouraged to run with perseverance. There are some of you in whom God has invested great potential. And you will do well. You will do well if you are diligent and if you study to show yourself approved unto God.
So my dear friends, we are called to press on towards particular goals and purposes in life. And my prayer is that the true vine, Christ himself, will so so that we shall be fruitful. I pray that Christ, working by the power of the Holy Spirit, will take care of every weakness and every failure, every emotional and every spiritual disability that we have in our lives, any hindrance and temptation that threaten to run us down so that we can study to show ourselves approved unto God. No, Paul says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The question that I leave with you is, do you want to be a drifter, a failure, or a conqueror? Study to show yourself approved unto God, and you will always conquer to the glory of God and the blessing of his people. Amen. God bless you. Shall we return to prayer? I'd like you to whisper something to God about your own life and where it is going. What has God called you to do? What are the opportunities you have? You are a student, newly married couple. You are somebody who is starting work, looking for work, doing some small business, whatever you are in life. Just pray that God will make you purposeful. God will make you diligent that you will study to show yourself approved unto him. And pray that God will take hold of that project. If the project is of him, you will succeed. That God will take hold of that project, that you might be a blessing. Pray for grace, the grace to be able to stay away from those things that don't make you productive. If the thing is a waste of time, pray for God to help you to drop it. If a friend is a distraction, I'm not saying be at loggerheads, but walk away from that life because you are not likely to go far. If you keep relationships like that. My prayer that God will visit us, each one of us, each one of us, by the presence of his spirit, take care of our weaknesses. May he take care of our failures. 